Hello again guys, I'm filling in the mood for a little storytelling. It's me again Festus, here to introduce you to a whole new cast of characters, except for the originals, which is me, Festus, your belligerent narrator. I'm engaged with Lady K. We're both working on our PhD part-time while working at a research lab. We work hard and lift harder. Lady K, as mentioned before, she's one of the women that attract the attention of Sir Ham. Okay, now it's time for the main one, Jake the Beard. He is exceedingly fat. He's the Baron Harkonnen of the story. He's around six foot, but 350 pounds. He likes anime anything. He has a grad degree in computer science, but he's actually kind of smart. He doesn't apply himself. He's really lazy, and he thinks he's indispensable, as he is the only computer guy on the research team. Anne, the head of the research team. She's really smart. Duh. She's got five different PhDs. She's very strict, but she's very nice. She's five foot four and just attractive enough for her to be beard bait but not being so attractive as to put them off she's super chill she doesn't judge anyone just in case their science is good pete he's my friend on the team we work pretty closely as our fields overlap he does chemistry at a phd he's the chillest guy i've ever met and he's real gullible he's not mentioned much in this story but i'll bring him up anyway our story starts as soon as lady k and i left university fresh with our new shiny master's degree we got snapped up by a research lab, who also sponsored our PhDs, with the contract that we work with, during, and after the completion of the PhDs. The job doesn't pay much, but we get by on a tiny flat, and crappy internet, looking ahead to the time when our contracts expire, so we can make more money. As a matter of fact, the story really starts at the first day of our new job, where it just so happens that a new research project had just been started, and we could fit right into the team, and shows us around the lab. Our our eyes shining like childs in a toy store, looking at all the fancy and exciting science stuff that we'll be using on a day-to-day -day basis. We meet Pete. He and I naturally get into a macho showdown. We stare at each other in the eyes, and we strain not to blink. Or, he didn't look up. He just merely said a quick, hi, to us as we passed. Labs generally have no eating rules in the place. That way you can prevent contamination of samples, or get stuff on your food. Tapping away on his keyboard was Jake, who greets us by doing an overly dramatic chair spin, and saying, in the most American accent possible, Ah, the new arrivals. It's bloody marvelous to have you two here at last. I won't fault him for being welcoming, but he act like he owned the place. Granted, he did take up a substantial amount of the spare room in the lab, but that does not equal ownership. Otherwise, Counter-Strike would own me. Jake spots the glittering ring on Lady K, and he chuckles to himself before saying, Why'd he even bother giving you that ring? It's hardly there. The idiot can't value you very much? That he thinks a 400 pound ring is good enough for anyone? I forced a smile out in the most uncomfortable way that us Brits master at a very young age, contemplating the vast expense of the ring, which was made with platinum rather than silver or white gold, both of which are much cheaper. I don't know what it is, but I despise using gold if I can avoid it. I think it looks tacky and fake. The ring was set with a small black diamond, which was her favorite stone. I had put a lot of thought into the ring. I even stole one of Lady K's favorites to get the right ring ring size. We both adored the ring, and to tell you the truth, I nearly missed a payment on the student debt, the money which was lent to me by my parents. Lent. Not given. I'm not like Andrew. Jake blunders on through the social interaction, directs a salvo of questions to Lady K. Is he mean to you? Do you love him? And then the killer. Does he make you scream at night? The first three she answered, but the last one had her telling him, with an icy shard in her voice, It's none of your business what we do at night. Jake didn't know that I was the guy, and at this point, I had a really strange feeling of deja vu. Seeing the impending doom, I quickly averted it by firing a question back at Jake. So, you're the computer guy, huh? What do you do exactly? Jake took this opportunity to launch into a very lengthy and loud explanation of what he did on a day-to-day -day basis, which was basically, I take all your numbers from your little experiments 
and I entered them into my self-made program. Which was worse in every way than the free online software. Then I graphed the data. I also set up the computers for the experiments. And I'm the acting essential IT guy for the research team. He threw in some other technical terms, clearly expecting us not to know anything about them, but he was totally unaware of my immense nerdiness, as I've done coding, PC building, and other related things. However, instead of calling him out on his crap, I filed the data away, so we can have at least a short-term workplace harmony. The rest of the week passed by fairly uneventfully. The experiments were done, data was logged, and Jake constantly hit on Ann and Lady K, making the commutes back and forth from home kind of awkward for lady k but it was actually enjoyable too because we swapped tales of jake's comments and Anne's equally hilarious reactions to his comments these reactions included but not limited to ignoring him blushing turning extremely white like a frightened chameleon on a bed sheet spinning on her heels and swooshing away and sneezing no joke she genuinely sneezed in surprise when he made one particular outrageous comment like wow I can barely focus on numbers with your awe-inspiring ass majestically looming nearby. Sir Ham the Goblet of Dew Part 2 well, 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 neckbeard seekers, we meet again to swap another story of the dark things that lurk within the minds of neckbeards, of curdled Dorito dips, and mysterious particles of unmentionable food. Today, we'll be dealing with the most peculiar tale, one of our dear friend Jake, and his heroic acts in the face of dangers. One crisp Monday morning, our heroes are gathering in the shelter of the small science laboratory from the frigid gale that has buffeted the windows. Heating was turned up. Our valiant protagonist was preparing to conduct an experiment which involved some very, 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 very dangerous chemicals. Specifically, a very high concentration of hydrogen peroxide. There's a Wikipedia article on this. The gist is, when you're dealing with high concentrated H2O2, you have to be very careful. It's basically old-fashioned rocket fuel, and it has a massive explosion risk. Even at 50% concentration, the slightest spark, and there's a fiery explosion that kills you and anyone nearby, or makes you wish you were dead. The experiment used a substantial amount of stuff, so there was far more stringent rules put into place than usual. Things such as, don't leave anything at your station, tidy up immediately, wear protective suits to prevent any getting on you or on your skin, and if it gets on your suit, you go to the emergency showers immediately. That was to keep us safe and to keep the lab from being sued just in case of an accident. So Lady K and I set up the experiment and comes over to inspect it, making sure everything's to specification, looking to see if it's surgically clean, removing any possible variables such as things brought about by dirt. Jake was seated in the adjacent room, ensuring that all the slow motion camera feeds were working properly while munching on copious amounts of snack foods. Pete was checking temperatures, concentrations, pH levels, and ensuring that everything was exactly the way it should be, and recorded everything. Finally, the afternoon, everyone was ready. The atmosphere was palpable and was very pleased at the precise and fast work, meaning the experiment can run sooner. With bated breath, we watched the cameras begin to flash and blink to indicate that it was now recording and read off the name of the experiment, the date, the time, as well as the team members before motioning us to start the experiment. With careful movements, we start to perform the experiment, putting drops of various chemicals onto others, just the final stages of the experiment experiment was occurring. Then Jake burst into the room. He pulls Lady K back from the chemicals. There's a spill which threatened your life. I felt like it was my duty to heroically save you before you could come to harm. He got pushed back by Lady K, but it was too late. The window of opportunity to add the final chemical had passed, and Jake had contaminated the environment too much to continue. I wasn't really listening, as I was more irate that we had to redo the experiment because of just one last crucial step had not happened due to a brash beard's blundering aid being given at the least helpful time. There were three things that annoyed me. One, there was not a spill of H2O2, rather it was a tiny 
amount of alcohol, which is used to clean the equipment without leaving residue. Number two, we had to reset the entire experiment. One part was useless without the others. And the items, they're unstable. The products of stage one, they don't last long enough to be stored. And as well, they're very dangerous to store because of their explosive nature. Additionally, the protective gear was really hot and sweaty, and I'd had to get back into that at least one more time, thanks to this beard's heroic act. Number three, Jake didn't follow lab procedure, which would have involved the intercom system being used to warn us about the spill to avoid situations as the one he just caused. Jake got a very stern talking to, and he got his monthly bonus docked due to his actions, but the worst is yet to come. The protective suits are large enough to wear over your clothing, but the gloves are tight, so you can retain manual dexterity while you're wearing them. As a result, you can't wear rings or bracelets, so Lady K had to remove her ring and carefully placed it inside of her locker. These spaces have locks, but they're basically useless. It can be opened, no joke, with the handle of a teaspoon. We've only worked at the lab for only two weeks at this point, so we didn't know the nature of these crappy locks. As we retrieved our personal belongings, Lady K's locker was adjacent to Jake's. He had spent several hours unsupervised. While we were setting up the experiment, Lady K turned to me in tears, and she whispered, Festus, it's gone. The ring is gone. I was shocked. As I watched her put her ring in there, I was certain of it. But nevertheless, we carefully scrutinized the ground around. Our search returned no results. And so Lady K asked everyone if they'd seen her ring. Lo and behold, Jake piped up at that moment with his annoying voice and said, Oh, yeah. I found it on the floor outside your locker. So I picked it up to give it back to you. Jake pulled the ring out of his pocket, as he said he placed it there for safekeeping, instead of putting it on Lady K's desk, which would have been the reasonable move. Now, there was no way that the ring was actually on the floor, but we chose to give Jake the benefit of the doubt, and we let him off. Tears of relief rolled down Lady K's cheeks, as she buried her head into my shoulder. I kissed her forehead, and I hugged her in a comforting way. Jake was astounded, and he looked at Lady K with horror and distaste, before finally saying, you're cheating on your fiance with him? I looked at him oddly, only realizing then that he didn't know that I was her fiance, and explained very carefully I'm her fiance. Even if I wasn't, her cheating is none of your business. You don't even know either of us. As we commuted home, we decided to take a cheat night that night and order pizza, because it was a stressful one. Thanks to Jake. Now we enter in the territory of the weight room, where we get to experience Sir Ham and his fat logic. Here we go. Our work is relatively hazardous. As opposed to some comfy office jobs, where you just sit there and tap the keyboard all day, there is a lot of keyboard work involved, and a surprising amount of getting funds for the project, which includes grants and so on. But this is all interspersed with messing around with dangerous chemicals, the sorts which you should absolutely not eat. Although I'm pretty certain you shouldn't eat anything in an office job anyway, except for your own food. I'm sure the paperwork doesn't taste very good. At least paper won't kill you if you try to eat it. This adds a level of risk to your job, a risk which must be compensated by the employer. In this case, our salary and package was really good. It involved a basic salary, which you always get, a performance-related bonus based on the ratings it was given by your teammates, and a conservative food and housing grant, and a gym membership. So it was. One lazy Saturday afternoon, Lady K and I found ourselves entering the gym. As if we were in an R no sleep, some terrible demon would haunt this gym, devouring the souls working out. As a certain neckbeard loomed nearby, spreading its toxic ethos of fat logic, placing his noxious miasma above the building while he did his bar-only curls, while a queue of testosterone-fueled teenagers took selfies and not really lifting anything. Spotting us, Jake began to grunt loudly, and he counted in an exaggerated tone, lifting his 20 kilogram, or 40 pounds, as fast as he could, which isn't really that bad. I watched him. He did about seven and a half before throwing the bar down. 50. Hell, what a set. Now, I'm a firm believer that anyone who wants to work out, that is awesome. I'll not judge a fat guy for working out. He's trying to better himself. That's great. It's only when they start to spew fat logic and corrupt the gym with that bile is when we have a problem. Jake waddles over to us as we're doing our warm-up calisthenics. He flops down on the floor, 
triggering all seismometers within a 10 kilometer radius. And it flooded the televisions with earthquake panic. He gets out a sweaty ham and chicken sandwich. I actually like mayo, I'll put it on various food items, but his sandwich was dripping with it, like water, and it was like a saturated sponge. Lady K and I finish up our warm ups, and we move on to the dumbbell rack. Jake, I noticed, was following us like a lost duckling or a fat wolf after a sheep, and copied everything I did. To check this, I started doing the most ridiculous, impractical exercises, such as handstand push-ups and one-arm pull-ups. Sure enough, Jake copied everything, perhaps in an effort to improve his form, or more likely like a snake measuring its body length, to check as to whether it could eat you successfully or not, and to see if he was much stronger than I. When he moved, he was actually fairly strong, for someone who didn't go to the gym that often. He lifted just under half of what I lifted, and he matched Lady K, so it was actually quite impressive. After we made our usual circuits, we broke for a break, and Jake joined us, gasping and chugging Gatorade from a liter bottle while we sipped our water to rehydrate. He pulled out a veritable feast from his rucksack. I saw chicken wings, thermos, and several foil wrapped squares, which I assume were sandwiches, but could have been slabs of lard for all I could tell. He noisily chewed down until we started to head back to the gym to carry on. As I rode the adrenaline high, I saw Jake saddle over to the abandoned deadlift bar, and I watched him try to lift what I lifted. Jake could not even deadlift one side of the bar. He looked around again, and to his chagrin, he noticed me laughing at his horrible form, <laughs> which probably wasn't cool, but it was actually quite funny to see. He strolled over to us, and he poked me in the chest and said, It's easier for you, dipsh**. Surprised at his sudden alphaness, I responded with a quick and fiery, Wh what Yeah, it's easier for you skinny f You don't have as much gravity pulling you down. I was mad, because Jake was coming over all Andrew-like. So I said, Look, if you can best me at even one exercise, I'll never laugh at you again. You can even choose which one we do. We had gathered quite a crowd of teenagers, bench bros, and bunnies, and unwilling to lose face, Jake chose to try to outbench me, as he just noticed that I just got done with 10 sets at the bench press, and I was pretty tired. Jake went first. He loaded the bar with 220 pounds. He actually managed to lift it. He struggled for every millimeter, but he did it, which is actually really good. Then it was my turn. The Bench Brothers, who was overseeing the contest, chuckled slightly as I casually added on more weight to about 310. I barely lifted it, but I did lift it with a grunt. Jake couldn't lift that. I was in so much pain after that that I had to run to the bathroom. Then I heard Jake shouting, If it was possible for me to lose weight, I'd be a skinny f boy like that, d so there you have it. The next day, I could barely move my arms, and my chest was hurting really bad. So that's your introduction to Jake. I have more on the way. Next stop, feminism. Jake tries to woo my ladies, trying to give them a talk on what their rights are. Hi there, all you beautiful people. It's come time to tell you about the events of the life of Jake the Beard. First, let's reintroduce the cast. I'm Festus, your narrator. Then we have Lady K. We're both working on our PhD part-time while working at a research lab. And it's actually kind of easy going. Jake, he's the beard. He is fat as heck. And a mew is everything. He's the IT guy of the team and the head of the research team. She's smart as anything else with all the PhDs to prove it. She's short, like a hobbit, as well as warm and kind, really relaxed with pretty much anything. Unless you endanger a coworker through stupidity, our story commences just a few days after the gym incident. Jake had decided that he couldn't woo my ladies with his physique, so he had to resort to extolling the heads of the third wave feminist movement. One dreary luncheon, as we sit there in the standardized chairs, in the standardized cafeteria, in our standardized laboratory. We eat our woefully prepared standard meal that was provided us, and Jake struck up a conversation. As I pulled out a chair for Lady K to sit down, he started off by tutting loudly, making us look at him, bemused. 
with my hand still in the back of Lady K's chair. He verbally accosted me as I lowered myself into my seat, picking up my knife and fork in a fluid motion, and began to eat. Don't you hate it when men have to dominate you by doing little things that you just can't do yourself? Said the mound of blubber, which had been dormant until this point. <laughs> I choked on my mouth full of mashed potatoes, leading to Lady K pounding my back so that she would ensure that I wouldn't die from asphyxiation, brought about by soggy lumps of crushed tubers. Well, you see, most of the actions that men do to help females is evidence of the fact that they consider females to be below them in terms of ability, and therefore require aid in some form or another in order to survive. They believe the female to be less intelligent, weaker, less assertive, and more emotional, but they themselves are insecure about their own weaknesses. The small action of holding a door open for a female shows the disregard that the man has for them, and shows that they consider themselves more powerful than women, and thus are allowed to dominate them by simply holding a door open, or pulling out a chair, even by the way the men hold themselves, or sit with their legs open shows that they need to bring attention to their sexual desires at all times. We were silent until I replied with, You know that men have balls, right? We sit with our legs open, not to dominate people or sexualize ourselves, but to make room for our sensitive testicles. I can see why you could be perfectly fine with pressing your legs together, however. Jake got very angry at that, spouting nonsense about, You're just part of the patriarchy designed to keep women down. Women are being systematically prevented from achieving academic goals and leadership positions because of people like you. He kept talking about this until Lady K pointed out, I respect men, and I can't envision a situation wherein a system was deliberately designed by them to keep women out of authority and academia, yet was designed so poorly that the only women at this table are both higher achieving and have more authority than you do. Jake looked at her with pity, as if she had had been taken by the evil man's lies and secretly hated herself. How you can not be a feminist and say that you're for equality is beyond me, he said. If you aren't a feminist, then you don't support the vote for women or social rights for them. Thinking that he had me in the corner, he sat back in his chair, causing the plastic to squeal in protest and causing the metal legs to buckle slightly. In response to his particular eloquent point, I laughed and responded with, Feminism isn't currently the same as equality. We have that. And there is a lag period between the rules and legislation being in place for women to excel in equality with men, and there being equal representation in the workforce. You're wasting your time pointing out so-called microaggression rather than dealing with countries with real issues, like Saudi Arabia, where women can be killed or imprisoned for being raped. Jake went silent, but I was not done. I needed catharsis on feminism. I needed an outlet for the pressure that had built up over the years from people calling me sexist because I will not support their movement. So I continued, Feminism is the empowerment of women, which has done good in the past. As the movement you're talking about, that's still pushing for more. How can you have more empowerment of another group while trying to stay equal? You can't. I got up, leaving my now cold and even less appetizing meal, and walked out of the canteen, going into an unoccupied disabled toilet, and splashing cold water on my face. Lady K joined me, softly saying calm words until I completely calmed down, by which point, lunch was over. I was willing to put all the crap behind me, but Jake wasn't. As we walked into the lab, Jake said, Ah, uh, the misogynist returns. And bringing along your conquest, I see. Anne was sick of the arguing and shouted, Shut up and do science, which is what you're paid for. Festus, I expect more from you. Jake, just leave it. Nobody is going to be convinced by your constant self-hate speech, so just knock it off and analyze this data set. Next time, the workplace meet and greet. The work party with science nerds.
In this next story, we'll have all the usual cast, but we also have new cast members. Catherine, the HR boss for our lab. If you have an issue with a co-worker, you take it to her. She's kind at heart, but deals with all the depressing stuff, so she can be a bit cold. Benjamin, the head of the lab where I work. He assigns all the money to the research groups. He is rich. And he's kind of old and 65, but he's extremely kind. He throws surprisingly good work parties. Our story begins at the tail end of Jake's feminism obsession, where he took every chance to call me out. To the annoyance of Anne, one dismal Saturday evening, Lady Kay and I were preparing to go to one of Benjamin's work parties as our first real opportunity to impress him. Lady Kay wore a gorgeous dark blue dress, and I wore a nice suit. We got into a small traffic jam, arrived just five minutes late, so it kinda looked deliberate. We made our way into the venue which was a large hall with rich dark wood paneling and a lovely carpet. We got our name tags and we approached Benjamin to introduce ourselves. We waited on the edge of the conversation until a suitable pause occurred. Jake lumbered over, pushed past us, and accosted Benjamin as he was talking to Catherine and some other workers. He forcefully introduced himself uh, and I heard Catherine there. darkly mutter about hearing a lot about him. Eventually though, Jake wandered off, and Benjamin drew us into a circle, embraced me warmly, and kissed the cheek of Lady K. We introduced ourselves, and got into a short conversation about Brexit. Oh, please, no comment wars. After exhausting the topic, we talked about politics, at which point, Jake rejoined the conversation, made a somewhat relevant joke about fornication with pigs, and ironically began to stuff his face noisily. Loudly, he asked, Why are these things so d small. You gotta at least eat ten of them to get a proper mouthful. Silence reigned until Lady K spoke up. They're nibbles. You're supposed to get to enjoy many different tastes and textures without getting full. You aren't supposed to get full on them, which is what the meal is for. Jake peered at her creepily up and down, eyes hugging her every curve, before saying, It's easy for you to get full. You've got nothing on you. For me, though? I need more food than a tiny meal, and there's a whole tray of these just lying there. Now, any newcomers to this series would be unaware, as Jake was, as to why that comment was so insensitive. Lady K suffered from anorexia for the first 17 years of her life. She recovered through sheer force of will and the help of her family. Even though she did recover, that comment made Lady K recoil as if struck, and Catherine's hand shot to her mouth. Benjamin, knowing Lady K's medical history, uneasily led Jake away and got him talking about computer software and work. Catherine comforted Lady K with a hug, and Anne came over to let us know that the bar was open. I left quickly, came back with a large glass of Lady K's favorite drink, and we drank more and more, talked to various colleagues about science, and we learned a lot. Eventually, time came for the food to be served, so we sat at the tables in our research groups, which meant I sat between Lady K and Jake, with Pete next to Jake, and Anne between Pete and Lady K. From the kitchen, they brought enormous platters of food, which was elegantly presented and made with gorgeous ingredients. It is my understanding that Benjamin pays for these parties with his own money, cause he enjoys them, and he's really rich. All was well until halfway through the main course, when Jake decided that his serving was too small for him. Then he grabbed Pete's plate, scraped half of the delicious pasta dish off into his own plate, much to everyone's annoyance. What the f do you think you're doing? That's my food, you f**k. Pete said very, very loudly. The hall fell into utter silence. People were staring at our table. Benjamin strode over to us. Jake was open-mouthed, as if shocked that his theft would provoke a reaction. We could all see the half-chewed pasta in his mouth, all smell and gorgeous seafood sauce corrupted by the gangrene of his tonsils. Explain said Benjamin, leaving no room for discussion or argument. Swallowing quickly, Jake got the first word in. I asked Pete if I can have some of his food, as I've been served a smaller portion than he had. And he said yes. Then he throws a fit when I take the food that should be mine. I had seen the portions. They had been the exact same size. Pete was shocked at the audacity of Jake, and he could say nothing. Thankfully, Benjamin was not a complete moron. He saw through the crap that Jake was spewing, and he had another serving brought to Pete. To the fury of Jake, who yelled, 
Fuck you, old man. You always hated me. Now you're insisting I'm a f***ing thief? Silence again reigned supreme. In an icy tone, Benjamin replied with a calm, I'm putting you on final warning for that. You are valuable, but never think that you are indispensable, because you aren't. If I could fire you and get a new man to do your job, I would. But Anna's told me about the modifications you've made to the software, which means only you can properly use it. Put another two out of line and get into one more argument and you're out. Jake looked shocked, but he remained silent, leaving soon after the event. The party improved after he left, and many scientists came over to console us about having to work with Jake's fat ass. I stopped drinking so that I could drive us home. Once again, sorry for being so controversial the last episode. Jake walked on thin ice for a few months after that. Next time, why fixing his code caused the beard to lose it and take drastic measures. Our tale begins around the end of June, one lazy summer day in which the rain pounded on the roof, slightly less than usual, as in the standard of Britain, when our hero took a sick day. Jake had taken a few every month or so. It really put a hold on research, because we really had to keep track of the data. So Anne and I decided that enough was enough, and we sat down with a copious amount of our preferred hot beverage and began to go through the code. Hours slipped by as we parsed each line to see what function it served. Anne was incredible with the VBS code that we used in the lab. While I was only competent, we removed many lines that required specific orders or passwords to get any meaningful data, and we changed all the code, which locked us out of using Jake's software. We tested every point by putting in the data and comparing the graphs and diagrams. Nearly the whole day went past, and we fixed all the crappy code, which Jake was using to ensure that he, and only he, could use the software properly. Finally, we were done, and Jake's code was fixed. The code was more responsive, more reliable, and more accessible. We could continue with our research after saving a backup of our new code and documented the changes that we had made. We made sure double and triple checked our code so that it gave us the right results before packing it up and going home. The next day, this is when the crap hit the fan. Jake came into the lab late and bringing his standard bucket-sized coffee and wedding cake-like muffin. He sat down heavily on his double-white computer chair, which he filled up entirely. He logged on, booted up the software, which we use for logging the data, and he turned dull red. I thought he was having a heart attack and went to ensure that he was okay, and also to make sure he didn't throw anything expensive, like our ridiculously expensive desktop, which we use for research. Tentatively, I asked him what was wrong, half dreading the reaction. What's wrong? What's wrong? He yelled angrily, his skin transitioning through purple hues and ended up at plain white. I'll tell you what's wrong, you Christian f Some dip changed my f code. I was blown away by his caffeine and electrolyte fueled rage, sprayed with crumbs from his once extra, extra, extra large now non-existent muffin. Yeah, bro, we just changed the code so that we could get some work done yesterday. It still works the same, but it runs faster now, and it takes less to compute power to generate the results. Who was we? Was it you and that c At this point, Anne stepped in and said very calmly, Festus and I fixed the code so that anyone can use it, as opposed to just you. Did I ask for your input, b at this point, Anne, who I considered a genuine friend, became very, very upset. She quickly left to the side room and was found by Lady K, who comforted her. Being a British man, confronted with an irate American, I instantly attempted to avoid confrontation by defusing the situation. This did not work, and it dissolved into a shouting match, after which Jake threw a flask at my head and pushed his computer off the worktop, which crashed to the ground. That brought Lady K and Anne rushing in. 
I was on the floor, bleeding from my forehead, surrounded by shards of broken glass, and Jake was sweating and mouth-breathing heavily. I am told that Jake attempted to run, but the door was blocked by Lady K, while Ann called security. I had somehow avoided a concussion and sat in the lab while Lady K helped me clean the cut. For his words, the assault on me, and the destruction of property, Jake was indefinitely suspended, pending investigation. He was forced to pay for the replacement parts for the computer, and was warned that we could go to the police and press charges. You would think that was the end, but it wasn't. Oh, the beard had one more ace up its sleeves. Every day, we had a local backup of our data to save our work in case of data loss due to hardware fault or destruction. Every Monday, an external backup to prevent loss. We got to work the next day in high spirits. We had finally rid ourselves of Jake to find out that our computer has been replaced, but the hard drive contained nothing. It's supposed to have downloaded our data from the local backup server. We contacted IT just to find out that he sounded haggard and exhausted. They informed me that they were inundated with calls from various labs to get their offsite backup, but he was dealing with a lot of unexplainable issues. The backups have been entirely overwritten and all the data was lost. Lost. It was only later discovered that the data loss was a virus. It had gotten into the backup server from our IP address, meaning it was put there by someone in our lab, but it was remotely triggered, causing all the hard drives with the virus to be wiped out. This included the PC in our lab, the local backup, and the offsite backup, meaning that somehow this virus remained undetected for a very long time. We never discovered who planted the virus, although we're very certain who did it. The virus was activated at an internet cafe. It reset months and months of work and broke down in tears. We had to entirely restart our project, meaning that new funding had to be negotiated and setting back our time scale by nearly six months, thus delaying projects relying on the results. Lady K and I were angry. Jake? He was fired on the grounds of assaulting a co-worker and also destroying a 25,000 pound computer. He had also taken two much holiday and allegedly destroyed the backup servers with the virus. Lady K, Anne, Pete, and myself, we work like demons to catch up. In one month, we did almost three months worth of research, setting the PC to process data overnight. The worst was over though, and we were rapidly catching up. We were using normal software to process the data, as opposed to Jake's custom bits, which was speeding things up immensely. There you have it. We're all caught up. And what a wild ride it was. It's been so nice to finally share my experiences, and it's a relief knowing that so many like-minded people had similar experiences out there, and that we've made it through. Thank you very much for joining me for this compilation of Sir Ham and the Goblet of Dew. I want to give a special thanks to my patrons for help support of the channel. If you want to help support the channel, just go to Patreon on the link below. Your help will be greatly appreciated. Well, I'm off, and I hope you all have a good weekend. So until next time, just remember, have fun with your failures, or they'll have fun with you.